Hello and welcome everybody to this lecture 8 on inverse problems in medical imaging. Um, it's good to have you all back here again. Um, what we're going to do today is actually the fun thing for you. It is the last purely theoretical lecture on inverse problems we have for this course. Um, we will discuss regularization once again and discuss further different methods. Um, but once you survive today's lecture, you will really have plenty of examples um, of the inverse problems world. Before we start with today's content, let's recap shortly what we did last week. Uh, we started with regularization and the reason why we did is um, there was this question, how can we address overfitting we might have? Um, so if you remember, we had some very nice example where we wanted to fit um, some data that um, was supposed to be on a um, polynomial of degree two. Um, and we saw once the um, polynomial order was too high, we had overfitting. And we said the answer to this question is purely regularization. Um, so what we wanted to have is um, in the case where we can cannot manually select um, the polynomial degree or, or just the degree of whatever function you want to fit to the data, um, then regularization can become useful. We said that we would like to keep all the features, um, but we would just like to reduce the magnitude of the parameters we do not need. So we keep the polynomial degree to whatever high degree we want to have, um, but then the magnitude should be close to zero or even zero if it's possible. And we said that this thing here can work well if you have a lot of features. From a mathematical meaning, um, it would be something like the following. We change the cost functional. And now we have two main terms therein. We have one data fidelity term or really just the fitting term we always had during the course um, of this lecture here. And we added a regularization term with some regularization parameter a lambda. And for one special example we did, we discussed the Tikhon of regularization um, where we derived also the least square solution when we add Tikhon of regularization. So really this simple regularization was the one we discussed um, in the last lecture. And today will be full of examples of um, different regularization techniques, as well as some derivations to the minimization results we might have there. Let's start with the first for today. It will be the so-called L2H1 regularization. Um, there's one difference compared to last week. Um, last week, we discussed everything once again in the meaning of linear operators. We lose, used least squares and straight lines, and we used sums instead of integrals, and the world was just nice. Um, so this L2H1 regularization will be a bit different because we are talking about functions and operators today. So let's discuss shortly what we have given here. Let's say we have an operator A and a function T and domain omega. What we would like to have is a function f that solves the inverse problem. So it should fulfill af equals g. Uh, when we talk about operators and functions, it's not guaranteed that we can really um, that we can have an equal sign between, between those two. Um, so probably you can just um, put this equal sign in terms of an integral relation there where you need test function or whatever. Um, but let, let's just assume that we can do it that, and, and that we would like to have it this way. So we need some problem formulation before we start. So we have once again a data fidelity term. C 
can we say that af minus g squared in the integral over omega should be minimized on the one hand. So this would be data fidelity. And if you think about the least squares fit of a straight line from last week, this thing here is actually quite similar. And on the other hand, we have a regularization term. Now, there's a few things we need to discuss here. First of all, um, I've chosen um, this pre-factor of one half because it's just convenient when we perform the derivative later on. But the more important thing is you notice we have here the gradient of the function therein. And this is where the name H2, H1, L2 comes from. So L2 because we have an L2 function and H1 because we use the H1 in the or the norm corresponding to H1 for regularization. Um, so remember, in the beginning of this lecture, we said L2 are the functions where the integral over the whole domain of f squared the omega is less or equal than infinity. And we said H1 is all the f in L2 but it holds that the integral of the gradient is less than infinity. So this is where the name conversion comes from. So this thing here on the left um, is once again the data fidelity term. And for convenience, we name this term here id. And on the right hand side, this is regularization. And it is named IR. So now we start to do what we always do when we have a minimization problem. We build the derivative. Of course, in this case here, it is not so easy anymore. But we will manage anyways. So we start with the derivative of the data fidelity term. And we let some h arbitrary. And now we just build the limit. So we look at t um, going to infinity. And then we have on the one hand id, so this function id of f plus th minus id of h divided by t. So we built the derivative in two direction h with t to zero. So let's plug in the data fidelity term. So we still have the limit from t to zero. Then we have one divided by two t. And here we have the integral. Remember the integral is linear function. We need the data of a of f plus th minus t squared minus the integral of a f minus t squared. Next, let's put the integral together. We can do that because they are linear. So in front, nothing really changes. But here we have the integral over omega, and therein we have the term af minus g squared. Then we have two times af minus g times t times ah. We have t squared ah squared. And finally, we have from the last integral here af minus g squared. So life gets already a little bit easier here. We can get rid of this term and of this term. Then we can get rid of the t squared here. So just of the squared and of this t and therefore of the t in front. And let's do some reformulation. 
So on the one hand, we have this integral of IF minus T IH d omega. And on the other hand, we have the limit of the integral. Sorry, I was missing this one half factor here of t times a h squared d omega. So this thing here is independent of t. So does the limit in front actually matter? No, we can get rid of it. On the other hand, this thing here goes to zero as t goes to zero. So what we have left is the integral of i f minus t i h the omega. And we call this thing here star because we might need it later. So let's just recap shortly what we did. We had this minimization problem where we had data fidelity and regularization. And we just performed the derivative of the data fidelity term. We didn't really care about the regularization term here. Before we continue, we should note a few things together. First of all, the scalar product of two functions. Remember, functions, not vectors here is defined as the integral um, of the multiplication of those two functions. Next thing you should note, the adjoint operator of an operator A is defined as the thing we have written down here. So we have that A in X, so operator times, times function is um, the wrong um, description of it, but operator applied on a function X. In the scalar product with y is the same as the function x in the scalar product with the adjoint operator in y. Special case, if A is a real matrix, um, then we have the scalar product using vectors and matrices. And the, um, the adjoint operator here is just the transposed matrix. And last, if A is a complex matrix, then we use AH. And AH is, if you remember, the complex conjugate transpose matrix. So you transpose the matrix, and then all the entries are complex conjugated. So these are the two special cases when you have matrices and vectors. Otherwise, if you have functions and operators, we should use the scalar product in integrals. So what we can do is let's get once again, sorry for scrolling back, but let's just copy this thing here so that we have it. So remember, this was the thing we ended with. And with the knowledge we just gained, we can rewrite it. So we can write a adjoint times a f minus g and a scalar product with h. So this is just an equivalent formulation. Now, this was the derivative of the data fidelity term. Let's keep it here for a moment and go back to the regularization term. And again, we apply the derivative in arbitrary direction H. So we have the limit of t to zero of ir of 
sorry, F plus TH minus IR of F divided by T. So let's plug everything in. And now that we know how a scalar product looks like if we have functions, we can use this knowledge. So we have the gradient of F plus TH in F plus TH minus gradient F in gradient F. So this is the sign mass. And now we can do the next few steps because um, the derivative is like the integral a linear operator. So we have gradient f plus t gradient h in gradient f plus t gradient h minus gradient f in gradient f. Now the scalar product is also a linear operator. Therefore, we use this and stretch those entries apart a bit. So in the beginning, we have gradient f and gradient f. Then we have 2 times t times scalar product of gradient f and gradient h. And we have it two times because the scalar product is symmetric. So it doesn't really matter if we use the scalar product of f in g or g in f. Then we have t squared of gradient h and gradient h. And last, we have once again gradient f and gradient f. So we like make life once again a little bit easier. We get rid of those two. Then we get rid of this t here. We get rid of the square and we get rid of the t in front. And we spread the entries apart. So we have the limit of t to zero of gradient f and gradient h. So this was the first term. And we have the limit of t to 0 of 1 half t gradient h and gradient h. Now, once again, this thing here is independent of t. Therefore, we can get rid of the limit. And this thing here goes to zero as t goes to zero. So in the end, the derivative of the regularization term is the scalar product of gradient f in gradient h. The next couple of steps we're going to do are, I would call it pure maths. I don't expect you to fully understand everything, but I'd like you to follow and, of course, ask questions if anything is unclear. And saying that, the next couple of steps here we do are not relevant for the exam. I don't expect you to know those details. Let's continue. We introduce something we call Green's first formula. So this formula says that the integral of gradient f and gradient h, so actually just the scalar product, can be written as minus the integral of h and then the Laplace operator of f plus the integral or the boundary of omega. And then we have h, we have the derivative of f
and we integrate over this boundary here. Now we assume something that we call homogeneous Neumann boundary conditions. And they state that the derivative of f in direction n, which is the normal vector of f, that can be written as the scalar product of the gradient of f in this direction is zero. And with those two things, it follows that we can write that the scalar product of gradient f and gradient h is nothing else than minus integral over omega h times Laplace f d omega. So we have successfully rewritten the derivative of the regularization term. We put now everything together. And with everything together, I mean the derivative of the data fidelity term and the derivative of the regularization term. And we end up in the integral over omega of the adjoint of A multiplied with AF minus G times H. So this was the result from the data fidelity term minus h times Laplace f d omega. We do some rewriting because we can put out the h. So we have a joint times a f minus g minus Laplace f times h d omega should be zero. And remember, we want it to be zero because we would like to find once again the minimum. For the whole derivation, we said that h should be arbitrary. So we actually did the derivation for all possible directions of the derivative. Now, let's call this thing here star. And there's one big question now. What should we do with this star? Because in the end, we just would like to find optimality conditions so that we can finally solve the inverse problem. But this thing here written down here doesn't really look like an optimality condition we can use. Let's copy it to the next page. And think about it for a second. We would like this integral to be zero. Now, when can this integral be zero? The obvious case would be that everything that's under the integral is zero. But please remember we said h is arbitrary. So h can be really any function we can think about. Let's talk about the first case. That is the easy case. 
if a adjoint in af minus g minus Laplace f is zero, then we are done. So if the functions would behave in such a way that they are zero, then we have found our optimality conditions. Case two. Kind of the obvious thing, this thing here is not zero. We said H is arbitrary. If this thing here needs to be fulfilled for all arbitrary H, let's choose some special H. Let's say H should be A adjoint times AF minus G minus Laplace F. So we would end up in the integral over omega of A adjoint AF minus G minus Laplace F squared the omega. Um, why is the square here? Please look at the bottom of this page. Uh, sorry, at the top of this page. We have on the one hand this term here. On the other hand, we defined h as being this exact term, so therefore we end up in the square. And we said here in the beginning that the assumption is that this term is non-zero. If you integrate over something that is non-zero and squared, Obviously, the integral is greater than zero. But this here is a contradiction to the requirement of the integral being zero. So this means this case just cannot exist. And we are back in case one. And case one is nice, and there we have optimality conditions. So finally, the optimality conditions are given by A adjoint in AF minus G minus Laplace F should be zero. And that's it. So this is probably not an easy task for you. You don't need to know all the details for the exam, but we just wanted you to see how things can be done if life is not so easy in terms of matrices and vectors. Okay, then let's go back to some safe land once again. Let's discuss in general LP regularization. Um, so we sort of did L2 regularization last week where we discussed Tikhonov. Um, now we would like to discuss a general LP. And please remember how we defined the norms. We said the one norm or L1 norm is just the sum of the absolute values of the entries. Um, the LP norm is the sum of the values to the P and everything then to the one divided by P. And for p being equal to infinity, we just take the maximum value. So we have given here three norms, the 1, the p, and the infinity norm. And therefore, we can kind of obviously define three different additional regularization um, techniques or methods. Um, they all have their unique um, possibilities um, or the unique ways um, how to use them. And we start with 
L1 regularization. So we are back in the safe land of matrices and vectors. And we consider the following minimization problem. We minimize over vector u. We have the data fidelity term here and the two num squared. So really just like the least squares we did. And then we have regularization term. So we use the one norm because we talk about L1 regularization. And we have gamma, an arbitrary matrix or operator. So let's define this thing here as ID, data fidelity term, and this thing here as IR, the regularization term. We do what we always do when we face such problems. We build the derivative. So the derivative of the data fidelity term with respect to u is nothing else than one half from the beginning, two from the square, and then we have a transposed times a u minus b. So this is nothing else than a transposed a u minus b. Now, for the regularization term, we find some more difficulties because we cannot really build the derivative of the L1 norm. But there's something we can do. We do some reformulation. So you can say x in the L1 norm. That is the sum over the entries is now nothing else than the sum over the square roots of the entries squared. And here we say this is approximately the sum over the square root and we still have the entries squared plus some very small value epsilon. And we call this thing here the epsilon trick. So we add some small value to the norm because we would li not like to face the problems of building the derivative without. Um, so life is a little bit easier because we do not have this problem anymore. So let's say that X is this operator or matrix in this case times U. So if we build the multiplication of a matrix times a vector, then we have that it is the matrix, we say the entries are called gamma. It's an M by N matrix times this vector U. So we can write it as gamma one one U one plus gamma one two U two and so on. You know the story. I do not need to write it down for you. And now we look at the L1 norm of gamma times u, and we already apply the epsilon trick. So we have the first row, which is now just one entry of gamma times u. So we have gamma one, one, u one, plus gamma one, two, u two, and so on squared. Then we add epsilon because of the epsilon trick. And we use the square root. 
for the next entry in the vector. We have gamma 2, 1, u1, plus gamma 2, 2, u2, and so on, squared plus epsilon, and then we add the square root. And so on. So this is now what this term looks like. Um, for a reason, so simplification, let's say that this thing here is called gamma 1 u, this thing here gamma 2 u, and so on. Let's build the derivative. So let's look at the norm at the L1 norm of gamma u, derived by u1, so the first entry. So this is one half gamma 1 u plus epsilon, sorry, gamma 1 u squared plus epsilon to the minus one half. times 2, because we apply now the chain rule, times gamma 1 u, times gamma 1 1. So this was the derivative of the first entry. Plus, let's go to the second. We still have 1 half. Then we have gamma 2u squared plus epsilon to the minus 1 half. We have once again the 2 from the chain rule and now gamma 2u, gamma 2 1. Plus and so on. So the story continues. And what we can do is we can get rid of the factors 2 here. So this is the derivative with respect to u1. Analogously, we do it with respect to u2. So we end up in gamma 1 u squared plus epsilon to the minus 1 half. Nothing changes here. Then from the chain rule, we have gamma 1 u. But the difference is now we need to add gamma 1 2 instead of gamma 1 1. Plus now for the second term, gamma 2 u squared plus epsilon to the minus 1 half gamma 2 u. But now with factor gamma 2 2. And so on. So the story continues here. We put it together. So on the left hand side, we have the derivatives of the L1 norms by U1, U2, and so on. And here we would like to find some matrix vector multiplication. So we put in here for the first entry gamma 1 1 multiplied with gamma 1 u squared plus epsilon to the minus 1 half. For the second entry gamma 2 1 gamma 2 u squared plus epsilon to the minus 1 half and so on for the first row. And then for the second row, we have gamma 1, 2, gamma 1, u squared plus epsilon to the minus 1 half, and so on. So this thing here continues. And we multiply this with gamma 1, u, 
gamma 2u, and so on until we reach gamma m u. Now, for this matrix here, we can write it as gamma transposed times the diagonal matrix. And here we need to plug in gamma i u squared plus epsilon to the one half and finally to the minus one. And this thing here, we just call gamma u. So this ends up in being gamma transposed times some y, some function y of u inverse. We discuss in a second what it is times gamma u with y of u being z diagonal matrix, but without the inverse here. So we built the derivative. We can define optimality conditions. So A transpose times A U minus B, this is from the data fidelity term, plus lambda, because it's the regularization parameter, and then this funny looking thing we just derived. This thing here should be zero. Let's copy it to the next page. So this is the optimality condition, but in the end, we would like to define this optimal value u. So we have u being equal to a transposed a plus gamma, lambda gamma transposed y inverse of u gamma and there the inverse times a transposed times b. So at first glance, everything is looking fine here. At the second glance, we realize that we still have u therein. And the solution to this final problem we face is iteration. So we look at just some iterate un plus one being the function of the last until we have convergence. So this is what we do in the L1 case. Um, the final question here is, why are we doing L1? Or in which case might the L1 regularization be useful for you? And the answer is sparsity. Um, so what L1 regularization does, it forces your solution to have zero elements. And L1 regularization is actually something I used in practice in the past. Um, I probably have told you that I'm working in the field of RF pulse optimization. 
And when I'd like to design a ref pulses that have zero elements therein for whatever reason, then I can apply L1 regularization to my problem. And this ensures me that the solution has more zero elements and this thing really works. We had L1. The next thing is obviously LP. So same thing we just did. Now for the LP regularization. Let's get a new page once again. And let's define once again our model problem. We have, as always, a data fidelity term. I know this is probably getting old for you now. And we have a regularization term where we now have the P norm to the P. And again, gamma is arbitrary. Once again, we call this thing here ID and this thing here IR because of regularization and data fidelity. What we already know is the derivative of the data fidelity term as A transpose times U minus B, A U minus B. What we need to do is we rewrite the regularization term a bit. So it is given as gamma u in the p norm to the p. So it is the sum from 1 to m of gamma i u to the p. And this is just gamma 1 u to the p plus gamma 2 u to the p and so on until we end up with gamma m. And you know from the previous pages that we can write this as gamma 1 1 u 1 plus gamma 1 u 2 and so on to the p and for all the other terms equally. Now, once again, we go to the fun thing, and the fun thing is always building the derivative. Let's start with u1. We have p, gamma 1 u1, gamma 1 u2, to the p minus 1, and now because of the chain rule, gamma 1 1 plus p gamma, sorry about that, it is 2, 1, u1, gamma 2, 2, u2, two, 2 to p, and so on. We perform the others completely analogously. And we end up in the derivative with respect to u1, with respect to u2, and so on. It's equal to gamma 1, 1. And in the second entry, we have gamma 2, 1. In the first entry in the second row, we have gamma 1, 2, gamma 2, 2, and so on and so forth. In the middle between those two, we have this value p. And then for the vector, we have the sum over gamma 1 u to the p minus 1, sum over gamma 2 u to the p minus 1, and so on. So this thing here is, if you look closely, gamma transposed. This thing here 
is defined as y of u. And now we can once again write down the optimality condition. So we have from the data fidelity term a transpose times a u minus b. And now from the regularization, we have p gamma transposed y of u equals zero. So with that, the solution is u being equal to a transposed a inverse. And then we have a transposed b minus p lambda gamma transposed y of u. And again, you need to iterate. So what you do in practice when you use LP regularization is that most of the time you set P to be an even value. Because if you choose an even value for p, you can get rid of the sign or the absolute value and therefore the sign when building the derivative and life is just easier. So we talked about um, LP, we talked about L1, and the final question is what about L infinity? Let's discuss the L infinity regularization. What it does, it reduces outliers. So if you want every value to be in a particular range, none really close to infinity or rather large, you can use the L infinity regularization. The regularization term within your cost functional changes slightly. You use kind of obviously now the L infinity norm. But when building the derivative here, you might run into troubles or it might just not be so convenient for you. So what you can do is you apply some certain trick. You define a slightly different regularization term as u in the p norm, not the infinity norm. During the course of the optimization, you just let p to infinity, and therefore you can approximate sort of the L infinity norm. So once again, the thing written down here, the L infinity regularization, and this trick with um, using the p norm and setting p to infinity during the course of the optimization, this is something I use in practice a lot. Okay, we discussed L1, LP, and L infinity regularization. Let's continue with the final two regularization methods we would like to present. These are actually two methods that are used in practice a lot, especially in the field of MRI. And the first one is called the total variation regularization. So total variation, this is not something you know already in terms of a norm. But I'd like you to consider the following regularization or minimization problem. We have some operator g u minus b. And we use the square norm once again for data fidelity. And then we add as regularization this term TV. So TV of some value u is defined as regularization parameter lambda times gradient of u in the one norm. So all the things therein, you know, already, we discussed already um, what we're going to do if we have a gradient within the regularization step. We discussed already what we do if, the, if we have pure L1 regularization. And this thing here 
is now similar to the problem of L1 regularization. And now for the operator gamma, we use the NABLA operator. So therefore we know what the solution looks like. It is given as G transpose G plus lambda NABLA transposed then this funny thing we called y inverse, nabla once again, and then we have t transposed times b. So in this case here, y of u is the diagonal matrix of the derivatives of u squared plus epsilon to the one half. So at the first glance, this total variation regularization looks rather awkward. The question is obviously, what does it do? And it promotes sparsity in the derivative. So it favors piecewise constant solutions. If you know already from the problem description that piecewise constant solutions would be the thing to look after, then you add total variation regularization. So this was the second but last regularization method we're gonna present. Let's go to the final one. The final one is called total generalized variation. Compared to the total variation that favors piecewise constant solutions, here we favor piecewise smooth solutions. Um, for example, if we have real images we want to reconstruct um, and we use total variation, we might have some staircasing artifacts. So you just see between the pixels or between lines some staircase. If you use total generalized variation and you get piecewise smoothness with it, then you get rid of this problem here. So of course we need to discuss what it looks like. So we would like the solution, which is called the solution U star, to fulfill the following. We have once again data fidelity. And then for the regularization, we have this term we call TTV. And this is now actually a minimization problem for itself. So it solves the minimum over some function y. Then we have some parameter alpha 1, some integral over omega, gradient u minus v d omega, plus some alpha 0, integral omega, and there we have some function epsilon of v d omega. So this is the problem formulation. And this function epsilon is given as the limit of h to zero of v in x plus h minus v in x minus h.
divided by 2h. So it somehow approximates the derivative of v. So in the end, it is a minimization problem itself. So this was, as I said, the last regularization method we presented. Let's discuss the differences of the methods and where they are the same and when to use which method. So last week, we started with Tikhonov, which was very easy. We had as penalty term the L2 norm squared, and we used one additional operator therein. And we said that we can have a general solution that ill-posed problems might get well-posed when using Tikhonov. And we were fine with that. We discussed a special form of Tikhonov, which was L2, where we used the identity operator um, for gamma. And we said that this does minimum norm trace. And we used it when we derived the least squares fit of a straight line with regularization. Today, we discussed L2H1. Um, so there we had um, the Nabla operator, or the gradient um, of the function. Um, as a regularization term, so it penalizes the gradient. Then we had L1, and that does a sparse solution. And then finally, we had TV and TGV for piecewise constant solution and piecewise smooth solutions. In imaging, actually quite common is TGV at the moment. I use a lot all variations from L1 to L infinity. Um, probably Kirsten can comment shortly on what she's using at the moment. So uh, we'll actually have a more detailed look into this uh, in the uh, next lecture. And for imaging, I can tell you it's more the uh, TV regularization that we use and um, hardly the L infinity. Uh, L infinity uh, is some kind of the dual norm of the um, L1. And uh, if you go to a different space, you can say it could happen that uh, you then have to use this L infinity norm. Thank you. And probably one short comment on my side. Um, when I talk about the regularization techniques I use for my problems, I'm not really working in imaging, but in acquisition. Um, so I'm, I'm doing like everything that needs to be done before the patient goes into the MR scanner. Um, and I, so, so that's a really imaging in the end, right? Um, because I'm not doing imaging. So I'm using probably very different norms than Kirsten does and very different regularization techniques because we just would like to serve another purpose.